All right, folks, so we're going to jump over to our next guest in just a minute. We're going to be talking fossils and comics, which is really, really fun. So I'm going to let Alex into our room, and we're going to get running. Hi, Dan. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Oh, awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We just had an awesome talk about some Miocene apes are pretty that are pretty neat, and you're going to talk to us about fossils and comics, right? That's right. Awesome. All right. If you want to share your screen, we can get that okay. going up for our viewers. And we're coming in like a minute early. Just here, I don't think one minute. I will yeah. do that. Hello, everybody. Yeah. I love your dino figures in the back. <laughs> it's like, yeah, got a few things around here. Yeah. When I was setting up, my partner said, "Like, no, you need to wheel the skeleton closer to the field of view." <laughs> of course, of course. Cool, cool. Oh, I'm gonna close that. Okay, I think we will be good to switch right. Share screen. Da -da -da. And here we go. All right. It looks like it. Right. It looks like it works. Okay. Everything we'll looking good. In the last one, yep, we're we're looking good. I already I love the title slide already. So awesome. Yeah, feel free to introduce um, so, yourself and get running whenever. Yeah, you want. absolutely. And, and thanks for uh, the opportunity to to come and and present for this. Um, obviously, this is an amazing um, charity here. So um, hopefully, we can raise lots of funds for a very very good cause here. Um, now I am at the Science Museum of Minnesota uh, in St. Paul. Um, Obviously, we've had uh, some things happening around here lately. Um, uh, so this is very, very timely, and especially for right here. Um, so um, this is a, really a passion project of mine. Um, so I'm a paleontologist, uh, did the PhD route, the whole academic stuff. I work at a museum. I get to work in a fossil collection. Uh, but alongside that, I've been a comic nerd my whole life. Um, so this is kind of a, a fun delve into kind of how dinosaurs and other ancient creatures have shown up in uh, comic book art forms. Um, and uh, then I'll kind of lead that into uh, an outreach project that I kind of centered around this. But the first part is kind of like a little bit of a, a researchy component. Um, and I'll also give a little bit of background for things that people might be a little less familiar with. So should be fun. Um, and as you're, as I'm kind of going through things, think about your questions and stuff, we'll be able to field stuff later. Um, so cool. Um, so one of the things I was kind of um, thinking about is kind of different ways that we learn things. Um, and uh, communicating science can often be challenging because there's kind of some difficult concepts and things that, that don't always come across in, in lots of different ways. Um, so things that really engage and stimulate people kind of hold their interest uh, is a really good way to communicate that. And one of those is through um, kind of visuals and through storytelling. And comic books is a really good mix of those two things there. And depending on how you work things, you can actually deliver uh, a decent amount of content whether or not you're actually even realizing that you're learning about something. Um, so I wanted to explore this uh, through um, through comic books, through paleontology, through what, you know, my background and what I know, um, and uh, really kind of see what we can take from this, uh, not only in kind of traditional STEM, but also through art, through STEAM uh, as well, which is really fun. Um, and uh, so paleontology has actually shown up in uh, comic books for pretty much as long as there have been comic books. You can go pretty much as far back as there are any, and you'll see dinosaurs and other cool things in there. Um, this is just a little smattering of the, the kinds of covers that you'll see out there with all kinds of fun giant ancient creatures. They're actually really not limited to dinosaurs. So this is a giant fish. Um, there's, uh, of course, um, T-Rex tends to show up quite a bit, and we'll hit on that too. Um, but it's often something that's really big and splashy because they're big animals, and a lot of them have lots of sharp teeth. And it's uh, kind of a fun and interesting way to mix things up for the characters in regular storylines. So even 
Um, characters and stuff that don't usually run into dinosaurs often have these kind of side trips into the past or, you know, um, other ways that they've run into dinosaurs, which has been fun. Um, I wanted to give a couple of few of my favorite highlights of things that have shown up um, over the decades uh, throughout comic books. Of course, uh, if you're a Marvel reader, you may have run across Devil Dinosaur. I'm still waiting for him to show up in a movie yet, but it's going to happen one of these days. Um, Devil Dinosaur is one of the classic Jack Kirby creations. Um, had actually a pretty short run of his own, but um, more recently he has been uh, one of the major features in Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. I'll hit on that a little bit later. Um, but he's kind of shown up in like, um, you know, Secret Warriors and a bunch of other random stuff too. Uh, another Marvel classic is The Savage Land, uh, which is kind of this... Somehow dinosaurs survived in Antarctica in this like hidden sub ice pocket that never really makes total sense, but don't worry about it. comics. Um, and there's uh, one of the, the kind of protectors of that is Kazar, um, who's the obviously the blonde guy here, but he has uh, his best friend uh, Zabu, which is a saber tooth cat. Um, and so they go around kind of protecting the savage land from anyone that might cause them troubles and of course have lots of run-ins with dinosaurs um savage land has come up all over the place um the x-men have been based out of there it actually kind of got started out there again through jack kirby um so it's really kind of been a fun thing that's come up many 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 times across the marvel universe uh another uh sort of classic villain um typically runs in with spider-man is sauron uh, that name might sound familiar from lord of the rings as well it's because the exact same name but uh this is uh frustratingly he is often called the dinosaur man he is not a dinosaur so basically he's a, a pteranodon which is a flying reptile uh so that's where he's got that big long beak he's got that big long crest coming off his head he's got wings of course um this is very pteranodon like features there um of course pterosaurs are flying reptiles not dinosaurs uh so maybe the name's not the best part but um anyway uh and he's got these weird kind of mind control powers too which is uh super fun and often kind of ends up tying in with uh uh, dinosaurs in one way or another, which is kind of interesting too. Um, really interesting, weird character. Uh, so the character Stegron, apparently the guy's actual name uh, was Vincent Stegron, uh, who was born as a human person, um, but found a way to turn himself into basically a, a walking, talking Stegosaurus, um, and also has the ability to control dinosaurs with his mind. Um, so he obviously comes into the Savage Land a bunch of times where there are dinosaurs, so you can take advantage of that. Um, and he, one of his missions is to try and kind of make dinosaurs be the dominant thing across the world. So there's one storyline, one of my favorite lines of his is, um, you know, there's this brilliant geneticist who's able to turn himself into uh, Stegosaurus and, and do all this cool stuff. Um, but he's, you know, a villain. He's trying to ruin things. And um, at one point, uh, someone was like, uh, you could be curing cancer. You are like this advanced. Why aren't you doing like good in the world? He's like, I don't want to cure cancer. I want to turn people into dinosaurs. And that's just kind of where he's at. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, on the hero side of things, Reptile is uh, a relatively newcomer. Um, it's been in kind of like Avengers Initiative and stuff like that. Um, so this guy, Umberto, um, basically inherited this uh, thing, uh, this rock from his uh, paleontologist parents, uh, who basically that thing enables him to then turn parts of himself into dinosaur parts. So you can have like claws of one dinosaur, you can have the tail of a stegosaurus, other kinds of weird things. Um, they ex apparently extended out to pterosaurs because you can have pteranodon wings. You can fly around too. Um, so it's kind of a, a fun one. Um, and he's shown up in a couple of the cartoon shows too. Um, and one of the absolute long-standing classics, though, is Turok Dinosaur Hunter. Uh, he actually goes way, way, way back um, to like the 19, it's at least 60s. I want to say 50s, um, and has more or less kind of been around ever since then. Um, He's been published by a lot of different uh, publishers out there. It's never been DC or Marvel. Uh, I'm pretty sure Dynamite owns it right now. Um, 
but um, kind of where my generation came into it, uh, there is an amazing N64 game in the 90s um, uh, for Turok Dinosaur Hunter, which is really, really fun. Uh, but he's been around super, super long time, um, and he's in the Lost Land, always running into dinosaurs and other fun stuff. Um, in the DC universe, they've got uh, their version of the Savage Land is Dinosaur Island, which comes up a bunch of times. It's kind of random here and there. Um, Superman had a run in there not so long ago. Um, so it's always fun when that comes in. This one also goes back to the very, very early days. It was actually introduced in the late 1930s in a Batman issue. So this has been around a very, very long time, which is really fun. And even though I'm sad it got discontinued, Super Dinosaur was another good one. Um, so this was by this uh, Skybound, um, but it was actually written by, uh, or is co-created by the, the guy who did Walking Dead, of all things. Um, did this very family-friendly, very cool, very kind of fun and sunny sort of story about um, this dinosaur. Um, so I'll point out the T-Rex there has his tiny little arms in front of him. Then he's got this little robot control thing that has the giant massive robot arms, like missile launchers and stuff on him. Um, so they didn't modify the, the dinosaur. They just kind of added all these cool features to him so he could become this super dinosaur to take on all the uh, woes of the world there. Um, so it was a fun, like about, I think they had 20 to 30 issues or so. It was really good. Um, so <clears throat> what I wanted to do is... Um, kind of go through and get a, a temperature reading on how comics in general have been doing in terms of representing paleontology. And I wanted to try and get a, a sense of what things were like. Um, so one of the things you do when you're a scientist and you're reading things like pop fiction and stuff, you can't turn that part of your brain off. Like no matter what, it's going to start looking at all, how all these things are. Um, so I wanted to take things like Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur that is a, a fairly new series, as well as delve into um, a lot of different stuff here. Um, just while I've got this up here, um, one of the things I really, really loved about this series, it ran for about 40 issues um, and just ended, I think, last year. Um, really, really great series. They introduced this new character, Moon Girl here, Lunella Lafayette, um, who is an inhuman, so she's got some powers there. Um, but most importantly and significantly, they introduced her as the most intelligent person in the Marvel Universe. Now, at the time, Reed Richards, which is uh, Mr. Fantastic of the Fantastic Four, is usually considered like Mr. Smartest Guy ever. He was out in another universe at that time, um, but still definitely top player, possibly even smarter than you know, who always had been the smartest person out there. And she's uh, just a kid too. Um, so very much a child prodigy. And it's a really cool and interesting character um, that they've introduced. And it's kind of um, gotten a, a good kind of footing into the Marvel universe now. Um, so when you're a scientist and you're reading comic books, you see something like this, where you've got uh, the X-Men character, Sabretooth going up against generic Raptor. Um, and when you're looking at it, you can't, you can't stop your brain from doing this kind of thing where you see, oh, okay, the teeth aren't, that's uh, not what that looks like. The eyes don't even have a pupil in them. There's no feathers on there. That's a really weird tail bend there. The wrist can't do that. Like all these things just start jumping out to you. Um, so I wanted to take that and actually use that in a way to kind of just see how different aspects of ancient life are being represented. Um, so, and in scientific fashion, I tried to get a sample. Um, so I looked at, uh, kind of took the, the scientist viewpoint through uh, 151 different issues. Uh, I was able to get a range from uh, 64 to, um, this was up till 2017, um, across 66 different titles, so not just one thing, and uh, 18 different publishing companies, so not just Marvel and DC, but a lot of other stuff, trying to get like a, a broad sense there. And you could easily expand this out to thousands and thousands and thousands, but uh, don't have that much time or money. So if there's that. Um, so anyway, trying to get a little bit of a sense of how these things are represented across time. Um, so what you can actually do from that is you start recognizing uh, some of the more common things that are showing up across all of comics. So within this sample, um, 
theropods, which are the meat-eating dinosaurs, of course, are, or almost exclusively meat-eating dinosaurs. So that includes things like T-Rex, all your raptors, your velociraptor, oviraptor, um, allosaurus, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, not surprisingly, those were the most common out of all of them. Um, Ornithischia, which is kind of the other one of the other big uh, branches of dinosaur evolution includes Triceratops or Stegosaurus came in next. Pterosaurs, flying reptiles, were uh, the next most common, then the big long neck dinosaurs, and then pretty much everything else showed up in very small proportions. Uh, the primates in there was almost exclusively actually, um, quote, cavemen or Neanderthals. Um, and then there's a bunch of stuff that kind of showed up just maybe a couple times. Um, so dinosaurs have a, a pretty strong foothold across all of the ancient creatures, which isn't totally surprising. Um, if you get more specific, so not just kind of the overall groups, but if you go all the way down to what we call a genus. Um, so for example, Tyrannosaurus uh, is a genus. So that's uh, one step above species. Um, so like species would be Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, and some people argue that actually other species of Tyrannosaurus as well. Um, so kind of holding it at that level there. It uh, gives you a little bit more of a sense of kind of what are showing up the most commonly. Um, Again, T-Rex or, or Tyrannosaurus showing up uh, as the most common of them all. Maybe not super shocking. Uh, what was surprising to me, though, was that Pteranodon, uh, the flying reptile, was actually the second most common specific kind of ancient creature out there, which is not kind of, I mean, they didn't even have teeth and they weren't really all that big. Um, so it's kind of interesting that those actually showed up very, very commonly across the different comic books throughout the ages, really. Um, Triceratops and Stegosaurus coming in next, uh, Neanderthals, saber toothed cats, mammoths showing up every now and then. Uh, and and then just a little bit of things like Dilophosaurus and Dimetrodon. Um, so for things that you can actually like recognize and be sure that you're talking about this genus, um, that's kind of where we're about. So T-Rex being pretty common, not, not a super surprise because that's what everybody loves. And it's a great dinosaur. There's lots of good reasons to like T-Rex. Um, one of the interesting things I found is uh, when you're talking about um, what people commonly refer to as raptors, you're really talking about uh, the family Dromaeosauridae. So this is a specific group of dinosaurs that includes uh, Velociraptor of Jurassic Park and Jurassic World fame. Um, the, the reality is that thing was a good bit smaller. Um, and these things really showed up a lot um, coming in at like 1993 uh, when the first Jurassic Park came in. I found one case of one of these uh, members of the family before that, and that was a Deinonychus. So this is something that most people really weren't familiar with until the first of those movies came out. And then everyone wanted to see these things everywhere. Um, and pretty much every time you would see them in comic books, they show up in the exact same um, kind of proportions and size and all that stuff as you see in the movies, um, which is a little unfortunate because there are some inaccuracies that went with that. Um, most of all being that uh, the Velociraptor is actually pretty small. Um, so it's this kind of vaguely turkey sized kind of creature out there, uh, would have been covered in feathers as well. Um, so there's a bunch of issues that were introduced, um, through the movie that having been said is still absolutely my favorite movie of all time. That is no way criticizing, um, Jurassic Park or, or for what it did to kind of get people excited about dinosaurs. Hey, we got a cat in the scene. All right. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Cats are good. Um, so, um, when you start actually quantifying, taking those numbers of uh, what we call anatomical inaccuracy, so that's whenever some feature of the, the animal is uh, not as we know it would have been in the fossil record. Um, the most common by far uh, issue was uh, that the teeth are basically kind of a big old zigzag line, and there's not really any difference between the front and the back or any of that kind of thing. Um, and uh, just to throw up a T-Rex skull, and they did specifically say this is Tyrannosaurus. So I can be very sure that they weren't talking about something else there. Um, there's actually really important differences between the size of the teeth and the front and the back of the mouth there. So if you're looking at the actual T-Rex skull, you can see tiny little teeth in the front, and then they get bigger, and then they get smaller and bigger and smaller. It actually creates different 
kinds of force and different cutting abilities for those jaws so they can actually break through bones and stuff like that. Um, a large part of that is thanks to the differences in shape of the teeth from the front to the back. So that's actually important anatomical differences that you would see there that often don't get reflected in uh, the artwork of the comic books. Um, another really common one is just going too big, um, just making everything giant and enormous. Um, so this is a really great example. This is a pteranodon biting off the tail of a plane, um, which would be a little hard for an actual pteranodon because they're smaller than uh, your average person. Um, they're certainly much smaller than this fighter jet here. Um, so unfortunately, I, I don't really see a scenario where a pteranodon can actually bite through a plane there. It is really cool, but it's definitely way oversized. Um, and that's really, really common um, for a lot of the different uh, ancient creatures there. Um, another really common one, um, but one that most people really aren't aware of, um, is uh, that um, theropods, or at least um, pretty, it's all of them, um, their wrists actually are incapable of doing this. So when you see like Jurassic Park in the movies there, they got their arms tucked up like this. Um, that's actually a, a wrist rotation that we are able to do, but the uh, these dinosaurs actually could not do. Um, the way their wrists are set up, basically the rotation happens a lot better this way. And that ties into um, kind of, actually well, ends up being kind of co-opted for, uh, flights. So when you're looking at a bird, you can actually see these same kind of wrist rotation as we see in um, these dinosaurs here, meaning that basically it, it creates this kind of scenario where the arms, uh, the hands are facing each other instead of facing the ground, right? Now, when you're thinking about what that would be useful if you're not actually flying, um, if you're thinking about trying to snatch something that's running away from you, uh, it's actually a lot easier if your arms are right here. They're good and strong in this standpoint because you can do this to snatch onto it with your claws. You can come at it this way. Whereas if your hands are like this, that's not as good a scenario to try and catch something that's getting away. So there's a super easy, easy, easy way to remember that uh, dinosaurs like this had their hands like this, not like that. And that is dinosaurs were clappers, not slappers. Easy. Clappers, not slappers. Got it. You'll remember it forever now. Um, and the other, uh, the last of the, the really common things is just getting the numbers of toes and fingers wrong. Um, so famously, like T-Rex has two fingers. Um, this is actually supposed to be a T-Rex um, from a um, kind of one of the older comics, but they definitely knew about the number of uh, fingers. In fact, pretty sure there's a thumb on this one too, which is just really far off. Um, but Anyway, so just kind of missing that that little kind of detail in the hands and or feet um, was another super common aspect. Um, now, what was actually kind of a little disappointing is um, what I call temporal mixing. So that's basically where you take things that didn't actually exist at the same time and mix them together. Most famously, it's you know putting people and dinosaurs together like that. Uh, especially when we're talking about dinosaurs like the non-bird dinosaurs, that never happened. Um, and in actually almost like a, a very high majority, 80% never explained the scenario that led to all this time mixing, which is a little unfortunate because I feel like you need to at least be addressing that issue. And most comics actually don't, which was a little disappointing. Um, but this was a really great example because not only uh, was this a story set in 1981, you've got a Smilodon or a saber tooth cat uh, which existed, you know, depending on where you're talking about, anywhere between two and a half to a million years ago to, um, you know, 10,000 years ago or so, uh, versus a pterodactyl, uh, which lived about 150 million years ago, all in 1981, um, without any explanation of how all that came to be. Um, so it's fun to put a saber-toothed cat versus a pterodactyl. I'm not lying about that. I like that, but it'd be nice if there's a little bit of kind of context on, on why that happened, um, but still, it's fun. Uh, and uh, geographic mixing. So a lot of people um, tend to forget that uh, not everything that lived in the past lived in the same place. So it's the same kind of scenario that we have today. Like if you were to, you know, walk out the door here in Minnesota and see a uh, lion, you'd be 
wondering how in the hell that got to happen, right? Um, so it was the same kind of situation if you go back into time. So some dinosaurs, even if they existed at the same time, would have never seen each other ever because they were continents away. Um, so this one uh, presents, uh, this is a cover of Savage here. You've got Allosaurus and Brachiosaurus, which actually uh, do are both found in uh, Western North America. So that part is good. But they've got in the foreground here a really fun um, kind of lizard uh, called Longasquama, uh, but that's from Central Asia. And even when you kind of look back into what uh, land masses were like at the time, they were really not close to each other. There's been no evidence of any of these things, uh, these uh, dinosaurs or this weird creature going across there. Um, so these things just never saw each other. So anyway, it's something to keep in mind. It's actually a, a pretty common issue when you get more than one of these things. They would take them from different continents and stuff and put them in the same scenario as if they were living together. Uh, the last one um, is just kind of how the, the science paleontology is represented. This is very rare. There weren't a lot of comics out there that did delve into it. Um, but I can tell you, if you do find a raptor skull like Alan Grant has there, you don't want to take the sharp point of your hammer and just start scraping on it. That's a very, very bad idea. No one will do that. Um, also, you kind of have this weird like grave site there where he very conveniently has these bones laying out there. Um, I have never seen a dig look anything like that in my life. Um, this one also had like weird pickle jars of like floating heads and stuff in their fossil lab that it isn't really a lot of use for that kind of stuff. But uh, anyway, it doesn't really show up very much, but it's kind of interesting to, to, when it does show up, what it looks like. Um, this is another thing. I just kind of feel like this is more of a, a public service announcement in particular here. So Pteranodon is what you're looking at right here. So it's a really recognizable uh, flying reptile. It's got a big giant crest there. It's got a big beak. Um, but it is so often, so often referred to as a pterodactyl. Now, a pterodactyl is actually a flying reptile as well. So that's the name there. Um, these are found uh, mostly from uh, the Jurassic from about 150 million years ago in Europe. Um, and they were tiny. They're these little itty bitty things, whereas Pteranodon was a good bit larger, uh, still kind of smaller than your average person, though. So it probably wouldn't be biting someone out of the air like it's doing there. Um, but it's, it's very, very common that people misidentify them as pterodactyls. They are Pteranodon, which is something different. And then there's some that just like fail to be able to classify it, whatever. Like, so there's a bunch of times where you get something like this, where it says very clearly in the story that it is a dinosaur, but that's as far as it goes. And you're like, I have no idea what they're going for here. So this is probably the best example of a, I have no idea what to even call this. So with those kinds of things, like you can't even like categorize it at all because it's so far beyond anything that's actually existed. It's just a goofy, weird looking thing. Um, that's about as far as you can take it. Um, so what I did with all that, um, so take all those lessons, um, from what's out there and what's been presented, um, and be able to use that kind of critical thinking and try and get, uh, kids who may or may not be interested in these kinds of, uh, this art form or this, uh, storytelling or any of these kinds of characters like Spider-Man, things like that. Um, and start to get them thinking about them as things that actually existed in the past and how those things are getting represented. Thinking more like a scientist when they're kind of just enjoying whatever uh, they might be reading or watching. Um, but the big thing I wanted them to do is actually create their own content. Um, now, this is back when I was a curator at the Virginia Museum of Natural History. Um, and we went into some underserved uh, districts there. Um, and we arranged for them to come and uh, have field trips at the museum. Um, so we would not only go through the exhibits to um, so some of the dinosaurs and stuff, but we went into the collections as well. So they got to see some of the stuff that normally kids don't get to see. Um, but what I try to focus on with that is where the science can actually tell us something about the story of the animal. So best example right here is we have a, uh, we had a cast skeleton of Allosaurus there. So that's the dinosaur featured there, um, which is from Big Al, which is one in particular Allosaurus that had a very 
hard life. Uh, lots and lots of injuries across the skeleton, including a broken foot, a broken tail, broken ribs. Um, so these are cases where we know uh, that all these things happened to this dinosaur throughout its lifetime. We know that it healed from them, so we know that wasn't the end of its story. But we don't know exactly how this happened. We don't know all the scenarios there. So this is where um, students actually had their opportunities to tell their own story through something that we know actually happened, through scientific evidence. They can take something like this allosaurus with a broken foot and they can create their own story about how that allosaurus broke its foot. So they're actually using real scientific content to then create their own creative content. I really like that fusion of storytelling with scientific evidence. Um, so we delved into that. They um, got to spend some time in the museum and kind of really get the idea of kind of what these things were look like, the size, proportion, stuff like that. Um, of course, uh, I was in the schools a good bit of, most of the time, actually, and I bring stuff from the museum to help kind of answer any questions that might have shown up in earlier um, sessions or just to kind of inspire them for, for new ideas, hopefully. Um, and they created their own little short comic books, which is really fun. My favorite of all this because uh, I just love calling out um, Austin here, who's uh, the, the kid in the blue shirt, um, just got so into it. He is like struggling. He was like, I don't know what to write about. I don't know what to write about. I was like, well, what do you like? And he was really into pugs, the breed of dog pugs. I was like, okay, work a pug into your story. As long as you kind of got some sort of ancient time factor in here, he's like, and like once that clicked in his head that he could make a time traveling pug that solved mysteries, he just went running on it. And it was this adorable story about this time traveling pug going back in time. It was awesome. And he was so hooked into the whole thing. Anyway, so that was one nice little success story out of that. Um, so it was a lot of fun. We did this as an after school program in Virginia. I'm still trying to figure out how we can uh, implement that here in Minnesota. Obviously, things are uh, a little different now, too, um, as we figure out our how we do outreach and education. But uh, I'm, I'm game for for trying out some new things with this try and get uh kids excited about science through um what i'm also passionate about through comic books and there's, there's a lot of fun characters there one of the big takeaways of found from this um we delved into two different styles of comics a couple of times people have tried to do like really really accurate scientific content in comic books like discovery channel put out a couple of these where everything's really accurate and it's cool but i gotta tell you the story's just not there. It's just a bunch of like things that are happening. It's just not that engaging and the kids really weren't that into it. Mm. But we also read a Spider-Man story where there's all these dinosaurs, everything was wrong, but it was fun and splashy and they had this character that they have a lot of you know connection to. And I think the, the real answer to this is in between. So you need to be able to provide uh, something that's engaging, that gets people excited and interested and want to read with a good story. But you can still fuse, um, kind of take that from actual science or things that are known, and you can make those accurate within your cool, fantastical story about Spider-Man fighting dinosaurs. So my main uh, soapbox here is to try and... Um, don't lose the story, don't lose the interest, but try and get as much scientific accuracy as we can into these popular media art forms. Um, so that way we're actually learning even if we're not realizing that we're learning, which is really fun. Um, so with that, I will say thank you for listening here. I wanted to leave some time here for nerd talk about dinosaurs and comic books and anything else that uh, folks might uh, want to talk about. Uh, quick plugs for Twitter, Instagram at Dr. Crocogator. If you're not sure if it's a crocodile or an alligator, it's a crocogator. <laughs> this is also, by the way, one of my favorite artists, um, Brett Booth. Uh, who's a, a well-known comic artist. Um, he is clearly a dinosaur nut as well, and he draws some of the best dinosaurs in comics. Um, so this is one of my favorite pieces of his. And uh, just a, one last plug. Uh, if you guys are into this kind of thing, I am also running a podcast, and we're doing a full breakdown of the Jurassic Park book um, by Michael Crichton. So if you want to check that out too, um, with that, I think we will have some time for some questions and discussion. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for all that. It was neat to see a lot of things that I hadn't seen before. I haven't read Savage yet, so I guess that'll be my first one. Like, is Savage? Yeah, it was just a couple Savage issues. Really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right.
try and <laughs> oh, there it is. Dutch. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, yeah. So that was question uh, number one that I had. Like, I haven't read Savage Eyes, so like, any, anytime I see a comic, it's like, ooh, dinosaurs. But like, yeah. Savage any good? Are there any like new comics that have come out in the last year or so that you really enjoyed the way they handled dinosaurs? Um. So they haven't. So I, I was going to say Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, but it ended about a year ago, unfortunately, because it was fun. Uh, you know, it had a good long run. Um, it was Although also we kind hear of, there's a TV show coming, hopefully. I've heard about it. I'm, I'm still eager for it. I haven't heard too much more than they're, they're planning it. But yeah, I think that'll be a good one. Um, as far as things that like regularly run in, it's not much of a dinosaur story, but uh, one of the runaways is Old Lace who is, <laughs> excuse me, a Deinonychus. Um, so one of the, part of the raptor family. Um, that's really just great storytelling. They do have um, kind of this, uh, a little oversized uh, dinosaur running throughout the storyline. It's a, it's a good one for um, just kind of at least seeing a dinosaur run in. Um, unfortunately, Turok's not running right now either. Uh, it comes back every now and then. Um, hopefully we'll be back at it at some point. Um, yeah, and then, I don't know if they're... Oh, oh, um, actually, just Wednesday, they started um, uh, this new story across the DC line, uh, which is um, Dark Knight's Death Metal. Um, and they revealed that um, kind of they have lots of different universe Batmans. And one of them, Batman basically uploaded his consciousness into the robot Tyrannosaurus that he has in his Batcave. And so now you've got a Batman T-Rex uh, in the DC universe. So if you want to go and check that out, that just started this Wednesday. Awesome. Well, that's super rad. Um, I did want to bring up something that came up earlier because I know there was some disagreement in the uh, chat. So you mentioned the particular quote about, like, I don't want to cure cancer. I want to turn people into dinosaurs with the attribution to Stegron. But folks in the chat. Was it Sauron? Sauron, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry, everybody. I was, I was a little on the fly there. I'm sorry. I think you're right. I think it was Sauron. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> no worries. Just like you were, we're doing the science thing. I want to make sure we're, we're accurate, right? <laughs> right. So one of the things I want to ask, just like from a stylistic thing, how many of the covers in particular had heroes like holding open jaws, like doing the whole like, like why do you think that's a thing? <laughs> Um, I, I think it's just kind of a cool image. Uh, it basically always means that they have to oversize these things. Cause if you actually try and like shove a normal sized person, even to a T-Rex mouth, it's a really tight fit. Um, but I think it's just kind of a, a good kind of instant image. You know, exactly what you're dealing with. You got your hero inside the mouth in this dangerous situation. I think it's, it's a cool image, you know, whoever came up with it first, then they're like, let's say, you know, in your head moving forward. So it is, yeah, become iconic in itself, I guess. Yeah, it feels like very old, sort of just like a traditional, like adventure comic thing. Like if it wasn't a dinosaur, it would be like a crocodile or something. But generally, like, I'd always feel a little bit disappointed when I'd see that as the cover image. And then I'd like flip through the comic, like I'd read the story and it wasn't in there. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of true of, comic book covers often anyway <laughs> where they very often kind of go with the most sensational thing you can get to and it's wait this doesn't actually happen but uh, I'll say um most most of the ways that I kind of came across and, and knew that these things were definitely in the issues is because they're on the cover um I did run into some where it's not on the cover at all you don't necessarily know going into it those are of course a little harder to to find in order to include in the study um so I'll, you know, there's different areas you could go into. One of the big things I was hoping to be able to pull out of this is how accuracy has done over the years um, to try and get a sense of, you know, were we, are we better at it now than we were, or has it really just been about the same or even worse? Um, and the real problem I came in was kind of getting a, a more even sample because um, kind of going further back, I was able to get a hold of fewer issues that go back to like the 1960s and stuff like that. Um, so it, anyway, my sample is just so scattershot that it wasn't 
useful in that sense. Um, but it's one of the things I'd like to explore if I can kind of up the numbers in the right time periods. Speaking of, like, I noticed that you, you mentioned some of those error and uh, errors like, you know, different geography, different amounts of time. And it made me think of like the ways in which dinosaurs and people or dinosaurs and metahumans or superheroes, whatever you want to you know, call it, come into contact with each other. Not so much stories like Age of Reptiles or Tyrant or Paleo or the dinocentric ones, which I do want to talk about if we get, get to it. Yeah. But it feels like in the past there was like Lost Worlds were the big thing, right? In the 19th century, the possibility there's this island or there's this land or there's a place under Antarctica. And then we kind of shifted after like um, the invention of like atomic warfare to time travel and radiation and kind of like the typical superhero stuff. And then Jurassic Park obviously came out and everything's genetic engineering. So present moment, what do you think are the ways from what you've seen that people and dinosaurs are brought into conflict with each other through these sort of traditional settings or is it kind of a hodgepodge of like everything now because it seems like there's nostalgia but no one quite knows what to do after Jurassic Park came out yeah um I'd say the the kind of lost land is is by far the most common scenario that you're seeing across really all ages even in more recent stuff I'd say though uh, a lot of Things with that, like Lost Land, like I would include Savage Land in that and Dinosaur Island. And these both have histories that go fairly far back. So it's a little bit of kind of like maintaining pre-existing properties sort of thing. So it's not necessarily they're, they're coming to a new place. Um, what's interesting, though, is still things like Savage, um, which was just a couple of years ago same basic scenario where they just, you know, dropped in and, oh my gosh, here's all these things here that we don't know how they survived. Um, so that's still, I, and I've seen it in a couple other places too, of things that are, you know, you know, 10 years or less even. Um, so it still seems to be kind of the, the go-to if you're, you really want to have dinosaurs in your story and you're not sure how to get there. Let's, you know, invent this place that somehow exists um, all these millions of years later. Um, as far as like genetic engineering, I'd say that does, I have seen that in a few places, it's nowhere near as common. Um, and it, it is something that's kind of, you know, 93 forward. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Time, time travel, I'd say is probably the second most common scenario mm -hmm. after the, the lost land thing. Yeah. And I kind of wonder if that's for our modern creators, I mean, we're all dino nerds here, right? Like I remember growing up and a lot of the things that I saw in the eighties and the early nineties were reruns of things like the land that time forgot. And, you know, there was like the games that were coming out and stuff. And a lot of those things that were kind of made based on those like classic properties, whether it was in syndication or reruns or kind of keeping these things going. Yeah. Maybe that has something to, to do with it. It's kind of like the second wave of like, a, we picked up the stuff from like decades before. And right. Right. So was there a comic that you felt, aside from the things like Discovery Channel, like I know Marvel tried it years ago with, I think it was like Dinosaurs of Celebration. Um, mm -hmm. they, yeah. they do a scientific accurate, scientifically accurate thing. So other than those comics are supposed to like try and get it right, is there a comic or comic series that you felt like the dino, irrespective of whether they're interesting to the story, because like you said, that is important, but like a, a superhero comic or a comic involving people or a sort of more fantastic comic that got dinosaurs right, that you were like, yes, like finally here's somebody who like has done their homework on these animals. Um, yes, this is where uh, I'm going to talk up Brett Booth one more time. Um, so he did this short run series um, called Extinction Event, um, which I think was like the early thousands. Um, There's still a couple of inaccuracies in there, but um, he was – like he introduced feathers into the dinosaurs and that was still kind of a new concept really. So it was kind of looking at the dates on when these things were coming. I was like, man, he was like on it as this stuff was coming out and it still holds up really, really well. Um, and plus his art is just great. Um, he does a, a particularly a lot for DC. It's kind of fun whenever he takes the reins of whatever series he's doing, it's funny how often dinosaurs just seem to pop up wherever his art also pops up. Um, so yeah, if you want to dig up an old series, Extinction Event is a fun one. Cool, yeah, and, and he's great. I have uh, a couple of il his illustrations in uh, my first book. 
And I was oh, okay. surprised that he was, did so much for comics. It's like, wait, this is just someone who I thought did paleo art. So yeah, no, he's he's good. So do you feel like in a lot of these comics, dinosaurs are kind of like stock villains in a way, like almost like henchmen, <laughs> you know, because it's yeah, so kind of like writing from that. Like, it does it seem like we rarely see dinosaurs as heroes? Like aside from Devil Dinosaur, I'm thinking like dinosaurs for hire and things like that. It seems like a lot of their roles to kind of be like the foot soldier of whatever it was, or they're just like kind of like an environmental hazard. A certain place. I know it's no it's true there um yeah the environmental hazard aspect is especially with like the lost land scenario they're usually just you know or like in the savage land they're usually just kind of like oh my gosh there's dinosaurs here they're not like necessarily villains they're just you know animals being animals um but they all too often especially going further back like you never see them being the hero in in anything I'd say like devil dinosaur I mean even that you know, he, he wasn't kind of the hero scenario that he is in, in more recent times. Um, so I'd say there has been sort of a, a more kind of empathetic uh, version of dinosaurs in more recent times where they're not necessarily seen just as the villains or, or even necessarily just this kind of thing that's there that we got to worry about. Um, and some are even taking on more protagonist roles here. That's still pretty rare, I'd say, and they're still kind of defaulting to danger and, and worry. And I think that's probably true though of really all predatory creatures out there. I'd say that's the same for sharks, certainly and crocodiles and snakes and other things are often kind of portrayed as the, you know, the antithesis or the, the real problem of the scenario there and, and not the solution or the hero. Yeah. I'm trying to think of situations in which animals like that have been centered and the only time I can really think of like an animal I don't want to say as it is in nature because it's definitely not but the that's a hook jaw the great white shark and they had to revise that series recently and even then it was kind of like for the gore factor like you weren't necessarily supposed to root for it as a good animal but you want right. to but it did yeah so we mentioned it a, a couple of times just here and there uh, I know it's kind of a broad question, but what are your thoughts on comics that try and that kind of show dinosaurs in their environment? They're probably a bit anthropomorphized, but things like Tyrant or Age of Reptiles or Paleo and how they fit into this kind of dinosaur comic world. Because that seems like it's its own kind of separate subsect. It kind of is, yeah. Um, so I did have Age of Reptiles. I think it was the first run in uh, in this kind of study set there. Um, yeah, so especially um, for its time, things were were pretty accurate there. Um, so his uh, storytelling with that, if for, for those that haven't read it, is um, you got kind of these dinosaurs in their time and there's kind of, kind of compelling story there, but there's no talking, um, which makes sense if they're dinosaurs, they're not talking, um, which is not it's not everybody's cup of tea and I get that. Um, so it ends up being something that's, uh, was a lot harder sell for, um, kind of getting kids excited about stuff. Cause they're, they're looking for, you know, mm -hmm. a, a story in the way that they're a little bit more used to getting that in that form there. And I, I think it, it, while I definitely appreciate and I appreciate it even as a kid, I think I was in the minority in that. Um, so I, I don't know that that's the best way to get kids excited about dinosaurs in, in science and comics. Um, although it's still, I mean, it's, it's good and, you know, it finds its audience and people like it. And that's um, certainly a good thing too. Yeah. Which I think has been the case with movies and documentaries as well. Like we saw, we all, you know, Dino fans saw what happened with shows like Dinosaur Revolution and stuff where there's a lot of neat stuff and it's visually so impressive. And it was meant to be the sort of silent film and, you know, animals were, you know, given personality and stuff, but like in every single case at the last minute, it's like we need dialogue, we need narration, we need something. Yeah. I think what became Disney's dinosaur, like originally started as a Paul Verhoeven like feature length film about <laughs> dinosaurs that ended with this like T Rex versus Styracosaurus battle. And how, yeah, yeah, it's it just like no one's really been able to make it really take off. Like if you don't have that human element, it's just kind of missing. Right, right. You have movies and hopping back and forth. And what you saw, did, uh, I wonder if this is more the case in older comics. 
but did you see any just like outright copying of animals from films or film shots like like stills? Because that, that was oh like um, I'm trying to remember. I don't know if there's like you know any iconic like specific scenes repeated in there. Um, I, I I did mention the the raptors of Jurassic Park were absolutely just same thing movie comic movie like nothing changed whatsoever um all of the inaccuracies brought over um so that was actually it was i don't know if i really ran into good well outside of the extinction event i don't know if i ran into velociraptors drawn accurately at all um but uh i don't know yeah it's like iconic imagery i'm trying to think of any scenarios i'm not no, no, no. Yeah. I don't think it was like any scene straight out of Jurassic mm-hmm. Park where like, all right, there's that exact thing. Um, yeah. And the raptors are definitely the most mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. copied over one. Mm-hmm. And I guess going the other way, is there any comic or comic series, whatever it is, even if it's like within like, you know, a Spider-Man or an X-Men story marker, uh, storyline that you'd like to see made into a film or broadened out or wish that you'd spend a little bit more time to spend in? What comes to yeah. Is, um, um, yeah. I mean, obviously, go any of it would be amazing. Um, let's see, some of my kind of favorite forays into it. I would actually like Turok, I think, is long past due for a cinematic journey there. And I think that could be unbelievably compelling. Um, and I was so he's a uh, um, Native American. And I think that could be a great opportunity for representation as long as it's done well. Um, and I, Anyway, I, th- I would love to see a Turok series um, kind of delving into the the Lost Valley and the, the harrowing struggles that uh, he went through with his friend Andar. That would be great. Speaking of, have you watched, I mean, this is kind of involving other paleo media as well, but um, the animated series Primal? The, the- I, no, I haven't. I've heard really good things about okay, it. Yeah. Um, no, I haven't actually caught it yet, but... Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it, it just has so many similar vibes to a lot of the things that you're talking about. And like, I was worried at first that would be too tropey. And like, mm-hmm. many things are so familiar. Cause I mean, even like Turok, there was, I think like Kazar and like there were a couple other people like, oh, this is a great idea and we'll do it. But yeah, that's, that's worth checking out too. Um, just pulling back to a, a point that you made towards the end that I know you said you didn't really see all that much of it. But what about comics featuring paleontologists? Like, I know in the Jurassic Park, like, the sort of comic version of the films, we have Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler and stuff. But other than that, were there any where paleontologists play, like, a more primary role or represented? Almost nothing, really. Um, It's a little disappointing. Even when they have all these dinosaurs in the storylines, you you rarely get a paleontologist involved at all. Um, there have been a couple of times there's a, it's always like these cursory things for like just a couple of scenes and there's a paleo guy and then, you know, he drops out of the picture and then all of a sudden it's, you know, all about Superman or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, unfortunately there, there really haven't been the lead in very many stories, even with things that are just centered in dinosaurs. Um, it's too bad. Come on, bring us, bring us into things. We're cool. Yeah. It, it kind of reminds me of, uh, there was a GI Joe episode. From like the mm. era where there's a paleontologist and he, he has like the weediest nerdy scientist voice. It's like, I found these dinosaur bones. Like, oh. And then it's just, you know, the, the same way that it always. Oh, it's, yeah. It just seems the like that's the thing, right? It's like they need someone there in a white lab coat and a mustache going like, these bones are 65 million years. And then just shoved to the side for the rest of it. Yeah, there's um, pretty much exactly that with, uh, there was a Superman uh, where they just kind of threw in like, oh, Clark Kent went on a field trip with the paleontologist and like the there's this, you know, guy with his mustache and his glasses going, um, you know, well, I'm looking for tools being used by dinosaurs. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, that'd be amazing. And then instead they found uh, a giant trilobite that somehow had survived underground. And rather than being like, ah, <laughs> He's like, oh, that's kind of neat. And like, move on. And like, ah, come on, guys. Yeah. So this is a bit of a silly one. I know we're kind of running on our last uh, 10 minutes here. But if you could do the full uh, Stegron and turn yourself into any manner of prehistoric creature. 
<laughs> oh, I see. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, all right. This would not be like recipe for a, a... anyway, my favorite dinosaur of all time though is uh, Therizinosaurus. Um, and if you're not familiar with that dinosaur, it's got these massive giant death claws. Um, some got to be like 13 feet tall and um, totally weird, awesome, cool dinosaurs. Um, I would love to just be whatever version of that I could be, although I fully realized that it would make handling anything very difficult for the rest of my life, but it would look really cool. Yeah, I imagine typing might be a little bit difficult. <laughs> yeah, training. Not going to work well for you. Oh, and that reminds me, you mentioned Xenozoic Tales, and that's one of my favorites. Like, I absolutely yeah. love it. Yeah, or uh, Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. I yeah. Said that. Yeah. I think for me, like, I didn't even know there was a comic for a while. Like, I, I saw the Saturday morning cartoon show. Oh, okay. I, there was a video game, like an arcade game. And then I was like, oh, there's actually a comic, and the comic's really good. But, like, how often in your search did you see dinosaurs tied to ideas of sort of, like, ecological questions or, like, ecological upheaval or global warming or things like that? I know we talked a bit how, like, they're often in these lost worlds that characters can dip in and out of or they've got other methods, but... I was wondering in terms of, I guess, like the broader politics and, of some of these things, like did the dinosaurs ever carry like some of these messages in a way? I'd say they very often are tied in with um, where man's influence is not. Um, so it's this kind of this idea that not only has it kind of remain as it was, but it's remained as it was because people have not interfered in it. So it's this idea that, you know, we are influencing the world around us and it's thanks to us that we're missing a lot of these things in the world and that this place has only managed to be this place because people haven't gotten anywhere near it in the entire time there have been people. And I think that message has resonated throughout all of um, the kind of Lost Land scenarios, which is the most common within the comic books, yeah. Right, and as we're talking, or as you were mentioning that, it brought up something else where I feel like dinosaurs are often brought in, you know, basically as creatures of violence in a way, like that they're going to chomp you, they're going to slash you, they're going to jump out of the bushes, whatever it is. But it feels like very Batman 1960s kind of like Zap Pal kind of things where right. nobody ever really gets hurt. Like nobody actually gets eviscerated by that velociraptor. And I was wondering about your thoughts on that, about sort of, bringing dinosaurs out as these vicious things, but still kind of keeping them safe in a way. I mean, that's, that's kind of true of, of most foils that um, your heroes come across that they, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, even death isn't really death in comics. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you want to put them in some kind of perilous situation and dinosaurs, uh, especially these kind of big powerful predators. That's a good way to do that. Um you know, again, I would say it's it's similar to, you know, you'll see sharks and other dangerous creatures out there. Um, so I don't know that it's it's totally different from how other potentially dangerous animals get represented mm -hmm. out there. And it would be nice to kind of shift that into kind of, you know, as we're thinking about these things as parts of the ecosystems there, I'd say even the kind of environmental incidental issue is uh, of the dinosaurs is at least better than just kind of outright antagonists out there. Um, so maybe it, I feel like it's a little bit of progress, but it's been pretty slow. Cool. Well, that's all the questions that I had. Um, remember folks, if you're watching or following uh, with us to make your donations and when you do send in that receipt with your questions for people to ask, there's a lot more streaming yet to come. Is there anything Alex that you want to mention before we sign off? I see our next group is gathered. Um, thanks for joining here and absolutely please consider uh, donating here. Uh, this is a wonderful cause. Um, so I'm happy to be a part of this event and I hope uh, it uh, raises a lot and makes a difference. Thank you so much. That was super good. And I want to run out and read all the dino comics now. I'll have to make <laughs> some recommendations. It was good stuff. Alex. Cool. All right, so I'm going to just give my hosting duties over to the next group. I'm going to be back in uh, just a little bit to talk about Allosaurus, but for now, yeah, I'm going to let the next group in. So enjoy the stream, everybody. <laughs>